in sports, the scoreboard doesn't tell the full story, but Netflix does. Stories about dads who happen to be world-class quarterbacks and a battle for the heart, soul, and direction of the multi-billion dollar business of F1. Whether you're a diehard fan or you're brand new, Netflix has the stories for every type of fan. You can watch these incredible sports stories like quarterback, F1 Drive to Survive, Untold, and many more now on Netflix. Hey friends, today's guest is Chad Price, lead vocalist for the Fort Collins, Colorado punk rock band, All. Together we dive into the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the lead-off track, Original Me, taken from their 1993 album, Breaking Things. This was Chad's first release with All, and he stepped into some pretty big shoes to fill. He was the band's third singer, replacing previous vocalists Scott Reynolds and Dave Smalley, both punk rock legends in their own right. Chad was a massive fan of All prior to joining, and was amazed at the fact they wanted to play the song he wrote, and even more shocked when the band put it as the first track on the album. Admittedly, Chad doesn't remember too much about initially writing the song, but does recall wanting it to have that All sound. After all, he wrote it a full two years before joining the band. The song was part of his previous band's repertoire, but it wasn't until the rest of All got their hands on it that it became the animal that it is. It was great catching up with Chad, and we had a ton of laughs. He's as humble as they come, and one of the best singers, from both a technical standpoint and as far as raw talent goes, that I've ever come across. So sit back, relax, and let us take you back almost three decades. This is a good one. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Chad, how's it going? Chris, I'm doing great, man. It's good to see you. It is so good to see you. I, uh, I've i just kind of had the last two days to just reminisce about all the times we had uh, Less Than Jake playing with all. I mean, we did more tours with you guys or just as many as any, any of the other bands that, that we had played with that much with. It's, uh, it's incredible. We spent a lot of time on the road together. We have. Yeah, I probably played with you guys more than any other band I could think of. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's funny as as much as we hung out back in the day and and you've always been been quiet. Uh, that's no secret. And I guess I never really felt the need to, to dig into this. And, and there was a lot of fanboying with me going on, even with you, especially with the, the rest of the guys being the descendants, you know. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, I, I kind of want to set this up a little bit, you know. All is a very interesting band. Came out of the ashes uh, when the Descendants first uh, took a hiatus in 1987. Bill Carl and Stefan uh, got together with Dave Smalley from DYS and Dag Nasty, who f- went on to uh, front Down by Law. And they released All Roy Says in 1988. Uh, 1989 brought uh, vocalist Scott Reynolds into the band, and the band released All Roy's Revenge. And uh, three full-length albums followed uh, after that. And then, Chad, you were selected to front the band, releasing Breaking Things in 1993, which features the song we're going to talk about today, Original Me, that you composed. And I want to say, and and maybe I'm making this up, did you write Original Me for another band you were in? (laughs) Uh, Yes, I did. Okay, I remember hearing that. So you were in another band, and and was that version anywhere near that? Uh, what ended up uh, on Breaking Things? So I mean, all was my fucking all like favorite band, like flat out, especially around this time, like my late teens. So the bands I was in, like I mean, I was you know, you got to start song writing, writing songs somewhere, right? Sure. So since all was my favorite band, like everything I wrote, my goal was to basically write all songs. I'm like, <laughs> whatever band I'm in, I, it's, it's got to sound like all because all's the shit, right? Okay. So I, I started writing songs that I thought sounded like all songs. Original Me was in the band. I was in a band called Apple Tree, like right, right before all. I actually wrote uh, the song Original Me for that band, Apple Tree. 
which uh, we never really played or anything. You know, we pra- we practiced in somebody's basement and kind of like just never really even got to the point of playing shows. But then I actually joined off, obviously. But the point being, so I original me was the first successful attempt. <laughs> like I mean, all the all the other shit, you know, just I just threw in the trash. I mean, I joined all when I was 21. So I probably wrote original me when I was 19 or 20. And it was, I mean, really, it was like my first good song, you know? Is that original demo floating out online anywhere? Not or, a or... chance in hell. No way. I didn't think so because I, I, look, <laughs> I, looked, I looked for it and uh, I actually uh, dug pretty hard. I couldn't find it. Do you have a copy of the original demo you could share with us? No. <laughs> okay and, <laughs> no. and the re the reason i'm asking I, I mean i know you play guitar and you can get around and and, and stefan's just as you know incredible he, he just approaches guitar differently than anybody i've ever seen mm-hmm. i mean he's part punk rock part rock and roll part jazz part avant-garde he's just all over the place yes. but in, in his own style all the runs in this song and the different stuff like did you basically bring in the like the chord arrangements and then the rest of the guys you know did their thing on top of the existing song you brought in strangely uh, i mean normally i mean when you have a guitar player as good as stefan you know it's like just bring in like your three chords or four chords or whatever and have stefan like write some cool music or like some actual parts to it but that song as far as i can remember those guitar parts I wrote them exactly as it's exactly That's incredible. <laughs> like I said, I mean, I was like a new songwriter. Yeah. So like, I, re- I don't really know where this came from. I mean, as far as all the other, all songs that I wrote, I pretty much handed them like kind of pieces and they wrote the parts, but uh, original me was just the guitar parts anyway, was, was just done. Like I, that's how I wrote it. That is so cool, and I'm assuming the arrangement was what you wrote because this is a pretty unorthodox arrangement for a song. So, do you remember the band changing it along the way, or like, hey, maybe we should put this bridge part here, or was it pretty much the idea that you brought in? I think it was pretty much what I brought in. No kidding. I mean, they all fight it, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whatever that sure. means. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like when my band before was playing the song, it didn't. <laughs> even though the music and the lyrics and the melody is the same and it was you singing yeah it was me singing yeah you know it didn't really sound like all right it doesn't sound like all until you have fucking carl you know playing those bass runs and bill like you know just beating the hell out of the drums uh so i mean obviously it's a much better song <laughs> with all playing it than it was but. right right well for the listeners i want to let uh, everyone out there know i mean you're about as accomplished as it gets to me as a songwriter and a performer. I mean, you went from all to, you couldn't have went to a completely different world than Drag the River. Wichita skyline Deliver me home Be the light in my eyes Cause my life ain't worth living you've done mm-hmm. solo records and a vulture wake i i think it's one of the best things you've ever done chad that new single red yeah. it just dropped yeah. everybody out there check it out a vulture wake Death, drowning in red seas fighting till you take your shit Just really powerful. You know, I, I loved all eras uh, of the band All. Um, I, I love the, the Smalley record. I love the years with Scott. I felt that the Smalley record was a, a little continuation of the Descendants. It was kind of poppy. And with Scott, it, it was still poppy, but it started to get quirky and weird. And I felt like when you joined the band, the band got tougher uh, overall. I, I, uh, mm-hmm. Your voice has a little more, a little more grit and power to it, and uh, the compositions, just the the material on breaking things, just didn't have as much poppy and, and, and as, as much weirdness to it. And mm-hmm. uh, I'll tell you how I heard this record. Uh, I was at a Doughboys show in Gainesville, Florida. Right. This would have been uh, late October or so in '93. And uh, as they're setting up the over the PA, the sound man is playing this album and. Unbeknownst to me, I hear Original Me, which uh, it, 
this is another thing I want to say real quick. How stoked were you that your song got to be number one on the record? The opening, first track. <laughs> opening track. <laughs> it's crazy. What, like, what did you think when the band told you that? I don't know, man. I mean, I you know, I was just starstruck being in the fucking band, you know, <laughs> let alone like, you know, this is some song I wrote. OK, all right. Just kicking off the record. Uh, it's it's nuts. Right. It's nuts. You know, well, you know, here I am, a 19 year old kid and I'm hearing this. And then the second track, Right, comes on. Never again. By the time it's halfway through Shireen, I can't take it anymore. And I go over to the soundboard. I go, who is this? He's like, it's the brand new All album. And I was like, I didn't, you know, this is pre-internet, Chad. I, I uh-huh. didn't know there was a new All record out and I hadn't seen <laughs> anything in the record store for it, nor did I recognize the voice. Right, right. And I went out, went out the next day and got it, brought it back. I was living with Roger uh, mm-hmm. at the time and man, that thing. It got spun uh, probably probably for your for a year straight, you know. Yes. Um, I, I'll never forget, uh, like I said, getting the record and just being like, "Wow, they they've gotten uh, what seems like almost stronger musically." I, I felt that your addition to the band was really awesome, and then of course getting to as as, as I said a little bit ago, getting to tour with you and, and and see you play all these songs live and getting to know you. But uh, something else I didn't know, I didn't know that you sang backing vocals on percolator oh yeah 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 so like when those when those guys moved from la they moved to missouri right like i'm from kansas city right so those guys moved to brookfield which is like two hours away middle of nowhere middle of nowhere (laughs) middle of nowhere (laughs) yeah Yeah, i mean shit when i joined the band it's like dude you just stuck in this four thousand person town you have to drive two hours to kansas city or or three hours to st louis or something you know so yeah, so they uh they were recording uh, Percolator in uh, Kansas City at some little studio, and uh, this this is after I had already gotten to know the guys. Uh, so yeah, they just asked me to come down and and uh, sing backup and stuff. So so yeah, and that's that's where I started my all career singing backup on Percolator. It's incredible, and I mean, I I knew you were a fan, but I I never again never asked you and didn't want to fanboy out with you back in the day. But but I didn't realize until just now how big of a fan you were. This was like oh, yeah. your dream to to step in uh, to this position. Absolutely. I mean, when I was younger, I, I liked Descendants. I mean, I loved Descendants. Don't get me wrong, uh, but I mean, as soon as I heard, I might have actually seen all before I actually heard it. So like I saw it was all in the Doughboys uh, in Lawrence, Kansas at the outhouse. Have you played there? Played Lawrence, Kansas many times, the bottleneck and the Granada and Liberty and Hall. But ne- yeah, but never played. I actually played Granada with you guys, but yeah. uh, no, I never played the, never played that place. Oh, <laughs> what was that like? Uh, it was a fucking, <laughs> it was a cinder block building in the middle of a fucking cornfield, just out <laughs> It was terrifying. Like I was here's the gig, guys. <laughs> like I was going to shows out there uh, when I was a kid, you know, 15, 16, because like all ages shows didn't come to Kansas City. And uh, Lawrence, you know, was like 45 minutes away. So all the, all the bands I wanted to see, like all came to Lawrence. It was a college town. So we always had to drive out there. So I had been uh, to the outhouse so many times. You're just out there like I don't think there was running water. Don't even think <laughs> about using like the one bathroom. It was a fucking nightmare. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it would have been pretty lonely to be a punk rocker in the late 80s in Kansas City. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. I mean, it's all like, fucking Kansas City is metal. It still is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, Kansas City stuck in the mid 80s. But I am too. That's all good. Well, I got to tell you, after I uh, went to that Doughboy show, they were actually on on tour with Buzzcocks. I'm not kidding you. It was two weeks later, and this might have been might have been one of your first tours with all. It was you guys, coincidentally, with Down by Law, Dave Smalley's new band at the time, mm-hmm. and my name, and my name, who was also on Cruise Records. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, was that one of the first uh, tours you did with all? Had to have been, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I remember the lights go down and the, the band walks out and, you know, the light, lights come up. And there I'm looking at, at Carl, Bill 
and Stefan, Stefan, who's now bald. I bald. hadn't seen him bald. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, the guitar player's bald. And then who's this kid? Who's this kid on stage? And it was you. You looked so young compared to, no offense to those guys, but you were the, you were the baby. I was the baby. Still am the baby. <laughs> <laughs> those those old dudes have eight years on me. They do, man. And hell, eight <laughs> years in your twenties makes it makes a huge difference. Yeah, from twenty one to thirty, or you know, I mean, that's there's a big difference there. Heck yeah. Well, uh, Chad went on to record uh, three more albums after Breaking Things. Uh, the last one being Problematic in in two thousand. And I'm a fan that's hoping uh, one of these days we do hear some new all material. That would be that would be great. But Let's see, take us back now when you wrote Original Me. You, you had said that you know you were trying to mimic this after something all would do. But do you remember sitting down with a guitar and, and writing it? And and uh, take us back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is funny. So yeah, this was like thirty some years ago <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm asking you to do do some heavy recall here chad every time you do one of these do, do you always pick like 30 year old songs for people to talk about i've done 40 year old songs yeah, 40 yeah year old it's... <laughs> so so you're you're still the baby here right now okay okay uh well i mean i can't tell you exactly how it went but yeah like i said i'm just trying to write all songs for my band at the time we had just gotten a new guitar player who was actually really good you know like i'm not a good enough guitar player to be playing that kind of shit live i mean i can write stuff yeah but you know put on the spot it's like i can't i can't play stuff like that so it's like we, okay we just got this new guitar player aaron he's killer so it's like now i don't have to write these like kind of three chord songs anymore that i was writing so now it's like Oh shit! I can, so I can really do something here. I can write some crazy guitar parts because I got a dude now that can play it. So that's what I did. So I sat down. And I'm just like I was trying to get further into uh, more of the crazier sh shit, the proggy stuff that like all did. Yeah, obviously it's still a it's a pretty straightforward rock song. So my attempt at getting proggy didn't really work, <laughs> but. <laughs> But I was like, you know, I just sat down and actually tried to write like kind of cool, you know, weird guitar parts that I'd never tried before. You know, once I got those verses and shit, like the intro music and the verses is like, you know, these dudes are older than me. They I'm talking about all right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, so I was like trying, you know, just trying to write shit a little more grown up. So I remember as far as lyrics, I was like, all right. I'm just some dumb kid. Now let's uh, let's try to write some shit that <laughs> makes it sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> makes it sound like you're eight years older. You could join the band all. <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, I, I told this to Bill, who I had on the show, and Milo. You're the third person from the family that, that's been on the show. But what I always loved about Descendants and All was that it was all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Everyone's ideas got heard and everyone mm -hmm. got to write. I always admired that. So many bands are so closed off to, you know, this is my band. This is my songs. I could, couldn't possibly have the new 21-year-old kid uh, have a, uh, bring a song in that let alone we're going to put first on the darn record. Right. It's incredible right right it is it's so so you're saying pro you're you're saying probably around 91 you were like 19 or so you had written this song you're playing it in the other band and then uh, you bring it uh to the guys did they ask you if you had any material and and was this one of the first ones you played them do you do you remember uh they asked me if i had material i remember apple tree the band i was in uh we had a four song demo that i gave to bill Original Me was not on it. He obviously didn't like these other four songs. <laughs> and I don't think, you know, earlier when you were talking about uh, this, the original demo for Original Me and shit, and I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there ever was one. I don't think that band ever recorded the song. And I don't know if I gave Bill and Carl and Stefan a demo either. I, it was probably more like when I joined the band, I like sat down. And just showed Stefan the parts, and and it just went from there. I was going to ask, how did you articulate parts that are this intricate? I mean, this is a pretty, you know, it's not as proggy as as some of the stuff that all is known for, but it's definitely not just a straight ahead rock song. So mm -hmm. you, you're saying you sat you sat down and started showing them, and then then the song uh, kind of developed from there. Pretty much. I mean, those guys are pros. 
<laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. In case you've never seen them or dealt with them, they are professionals. Oh, I've uh, <laughs> I mentioned on this show before, watching those guys, I'm to this day, I'm slack-jawed at how good they are. Uh, Original Me is 2 minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, it has a six-bar intro, drums, bass, and stereo guitars, and an incredible groove right off the top. The bass is super present and punchy. Carl's bass part is absolutely shredding. Uh, on bar five, the drum hits twice on the kick and crash cymbals, followed by a cool tom fill. On the sixth bar, this happens again, but there's no drum fill this time as we go straight into verse one. <laughs> Verse one here, uh, Chad, I'm going to read these lyrics and have you set them up for us. Mirror. <laughs> You're laughing. Dude, this is nuts. <laughs> you, I got to tell the listeners real quick, but when I was emailing back and forth with you, you're like, I, I don't know how you, how long is this? You do these for like 45 minutes. How are you going to eke a 45 minute episode of this? I said, I will, Chad. That, I will. That is exactly what I thought. <laughs> like some, some 32 year old song. Like, we're going to talk about for 45 minutes. Yeah, because I'm a because <laughs> I'm a super fan. Damn it. I love you and your band. All right, All right. let's do it. Let's see. Let's see what I got. <laughs> mirror, mirror, please believe I need to find a sign. All of my life spent wondering who's hiding behind this face of mine. It's beautiful, beautiful poetry. <laughs> Basically, the song is kind of about just being lost, like not really knowing uh, what the fuck you're doing, where you belong, that kind of thing. Yeah, you're playing the outhouse in the middle of Lawrence. Right. Like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so and but yet you had mentioned a moment ago that you were trying to write something that you thought maybe was a little highbrow that someone a little bit older could relate to true yeah yeah I, I mean i was just trying to show that i wasn't like some dumb redneck from kansas city you know like i i read books <laughs> i uh i read books i use i did no but <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest with you. These don't look on paper or sound like 19 year old kids lyrics. They don't. This is really good. On the first and third lines of the verse, the guitar is playing these single note runs as the drums play a shuffle beat with 16th notes on the hi-hat. On lines two and four of the verse, Bill goes to his classic ride cymbal, double snare hit beat as the guitars play full chords. That snare beat I'm talking about, kind of like uh, he, he uses on, on Get the Time by Descendants, good, good, good things, you know, the classic uh, Bill beat there. And I love how it goes back and forth. Was it played anywhere like that in Apple Tree? Probably because that surf beat, which is what we call it. Yeah. The do 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 Right. That was the fucking all sound to me, you know? So mm -hmm. I think everything I wrote before I was in all probably, probably had that surf beat, you know? <laughs> okay. Okay. I love it. For some reason, that beat, I mean, it just, just totally changes the feel of a song for me. Like you, you can just play kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare, and you have one feeling, I guess. But man, put in that. Do, 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 do. It makes it seem like more is going on. Yeah, and it just makes me happy. And any of the bands that were were following and looking up to, the, to Descendants and all, uh, Doughboys, Big Drill Car, Chemical People, they were all using that beat. Oh yeah, it was like yeah, the, yeah. yeah, it was it was just awesome. Um, but I love how it goes back and forth there uh, in, in verse one. This next part, Chad, I'll tell you. Before I started really getting this under the microscope, I always considered this next part the chorus, but I'm calling it the pre-chorus now. Confusion, illusion. A misinterpretation of the original me. Confusion, illusion, a misinterpretation of the original me. What do you consider this part in the song? Is that a pre-chorus? That is a pre-chorus, yes. Okay, okay. I mean, the, <laughs> I mean, it has to be, right? I think so. That's what I'm calling it. That's what I'm calling it. I'm going to call it to the pre-chorus, and, and I'll, I, I'll kind of explain why now. You get a verse right after it, then it goes into the same part again, which is the pre-chorus, and then you're in what is obviously the chorus. So we'll go with pre-chorus here. 
if the chorus isn't the chorus, then what would you call it? Maybe a refrain? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I'm going to go that uh, this part's the pre-chorus. I'm going to read the lyric again. Confusion, illusion, a misinterpretation of the original me. This part is eight bars. On the confusion, illusion, the drums go halftime, only right there. And after uh, you say me uh, on the last line, uh, there's a quick two-bar reintro with the whole band. But as for this lyric here, confusion, illusion, and misinterpretation of the original me, what are you saying there? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just leave it at that. Let me take let me check my notes. Let me get <laughs> let me get out my trapper keeper. <laughs> with uh, my rat sticker on the front. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> okay that's that's a that's a perfect answer that's a perfect answer yeah, but uh, like you know like you're a songwriter you know sometimes you just write shit just to have something down on paper will you let me stay for a while don't forget me please don't cry just hold me close don't let go until i say so man i love this song i want it until i say so episode two hey everybody don't go anywhere after a few words from our sponsors, we got lots more with Chad Price. Just in time for your summer playlist. Punchline's new single, Find Yourself, is out now. Everybody got so good at everything. I'm just over here trying to keep my house clean. I have an eye flow, man. It's up and it's down. I'm wondering if this is why I'm people in town. Listen to Punchlines Find Yourself on Apple Music, Spotify, and everywhere else you can stream music. Duh. Do you like to laugh, geek out on music, and learn all about that band or artist who had that one song back in the day, but then seemed to fall off the face of the earth? If so, you need to subscribe to One Hit Thunder. Together with an array of interesting and hilarious guests, we do a weekly dive into one-hit wonders like Eiffel 65's Blue, Crayshon's Gucci Gucci, EMF's Unbelievable, Delamitri's Roll to Me, Los Del Rio's Macarena, Musical Youth's Past to Duchy, and even Patrick Swayze's She's Like the Wind. So are you subscribed to One Hit Thunder or what? As Desiree would say, you gotta be. And as K7 would encourage, you gotta come baby come and join in on the fun of the One Hit Thunder podcast. And now back to the show. If I'm going to single one thing out of here, what what are you trying to say with the original me? Like you were someone before or, or what what does that lyric mean to you? Original me, the title of the song. You know, I mean, I guess uh, what I'm saying is just like like where you come from, who you are as a youngster growing up. Then, you know, sometimes you might end up in a place very different than where you were and should be. And like, how do you get back there? Well, like I said, after uh, you say original me, there is a quick two bar reintro uh, from the top and we get into verse two. Trying a simple chime When the kiss across my mind Solitude in the craziness What the man were behind I need a sign A simple chime A windblown kiss across my mind Solitude in the craziness Of a world gone mad A world behind Damn That's good shit <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I, I think, I think, like I told you, I, I've always loved the lyrics of this song. I'm kind of marveling at the fact that you, you know, you were 19, how young you were when you composed these. I'm marveling at that fact as well. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you could sum it up, what are you saying here? Or do you need us to just edit when you said shit in earlier? <laughs> <laughs> just edit that in the whole time. Every time. Shit. <laughs> shit. On uh, on a world behind here, the melody changes. Uh, doesn't follow like the second line did in verse one. I like that. I know Bill 
is a stickler for vocals, always has been. Mm -hmm. Do you remember him pushing you in the studio? Remember him saying like, hey, maybe change this line here when you when you were in recording this stuff? Or, or was that how it, it was on your uh, original version with Apple Tree? It was probably like that. Bill is very much a stickler for vocals and melody and shit, yes, but more so of his songs. And I have to ask you, because going back and listening to these records, uh, they were all done analog. There was no computers. There was no pitch correction with the vocals. Mm -hmm. You're a great singer. You're a natural. But you were young, okay? Yeah. And when you're under the clock and you don't have much money, as you guys didn't back then to make these recordings, it's like, okay, go, hit record. Uh, are you still proud when you go back and hear these vocals on these records? Because they sound, I'm not hearing sharp and flat notes and behind the beat and, 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 and singers that are all over the place. This is pretty composed and put together well. Yeah, I mean, I I like it, like especially that first record. I like, you know, I mean, there there might be later stuff that I listen to that I, that like my voice sounds odd to me or whatever or or feels strange. But uh, breaking things, I could still put on and listen to today. Um, That's cool to hear. That's awesome. It just sounds like me, I guess. Strangely, you know, thirty years later, because I mean, this was your basically your first introduction to the world. This record, it's it's documented. It's mm -hmm. it's almost thirty years old. And you still think it sounds great. I can't go back and listen to my first couple of records because they were just shoestring budget, 19 songs in, in you know, 20 hours. Go, 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 go. Right, and right. I was so young. I, I hadn't learned how to sing yet. You know, I think that uh, at 19, 20 years old, you were so far ahead of where I was at that age. I, I got better as I went along and learned from the greats, you know. Right. But uh, I, I think that and that's why I asked you about Bill. I know that uh, he's a stickler in the studio. But as you said, it might be more so to his songs. Yeah. I mean, as far as like my singing and uh, my timing, uh, all that kind of shit, all practiced so much. Like, so when I joined that band, I mean, we, we practiced like six days a week, you know, probably three or four hours a day. So like I stepped into this thing and it was just like fucking go practice, 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 practice. So I certainly wasn't that good when I joined the band. But I got whipped into shape like pretty fast, pretty intensely. <laughs> That is, it's just awesome. But yeah, and, and I, and I believe it because you were, you were great. The first time I saw you at that show I talked about earlier, uh, you go back and look at, at uh, uh, videos from that time period. I, I believe you guys were around 94. You, you did million bucks on, I want to say it was like Conan O'Brien show or something like that. Maybe mm -hmm. 95. Yeah. Conan O'Brien album from my next guest will be headlining this Thursday night at Irving Plaza right here in New York city. Folks give a nice warm welcome to all. They want a million bucks But I'd rather have a million days with you My account doesn't go that high It doesn't mean you have to say goodbye to me Can't promise you a million bucks But I can promise that I'll be good to you Everybody wants a million bucks But I'd rather have a million days with you Yeah, go back and look and, and you sound great. After verse 2, we get into uh, pre-chorus 2. It's the same uh, lyrics as uh, pre-chorus one. And then we get into chorus one. We finally arrived at 49 seconds. And uh, there is harmonies on every line here. I believe that's Carl singing with you. That's what it sounds like. Yes, it is, definitely. Confusion, illusion, a misinterpretation of the original me. What big thoughts you have, like a scene. How many times have I heard these songs and I really analyzed them that hard? And I'm, I, of course, Carl does the backing vocals live. But I was like, at first, I'm, I'm in headphones. I'm listening intently going, wait, is that Chad like singing harmonies with himself? I'm like, no, nah, I think it's Carl. The lyric here is what big thoughts you have. I can see them in your eyes when you pretend to laugh. The reflection I see reminds me of somebody like me. That's a mature lyric. <laughs> What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> oh, that's what you're going to ask me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, no. 
<laughs> you know what's really great about this? And, it's, and I you know listeners can't see this. We're both grinning ear to ear right now. I'm, 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 having, a, I'm having a ball, Chad. I really am because I sang this song at the top of my lungs, screaming this yeah. as we play with you guys on the side of the stage. And I guess I never really knew what it meant, but it didn't matter because I felt it. Yeah. I felt it. It's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's deep. It's definitely deep. I mean, it makes more sense for people to take out of it what they want. Yeah. I think that's cool that not many people have said that on this show. I'm, I'm over a hundred episodes now Yeah, and not many people, one or two people have said that. I like to leave lyrics open to interpretation. They, they can mean something yeah. uh, different to ten, 10 different people. And I'm glad you said that. Yeah, certainly. On the third line here, when you pretend to laugh, the stereo guitars are still going, but there's this uh, cool, like old time, I'm calling it old time rock and roll, like panned off to the left there. When you pretend to laugh. Then on the uh, sixth line of somebody like me in the chorus, off to the left again, it's doing this higher pitched squeal. Were all those part of the original thing? No, 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 no. Okay, so that was Stefan going off. Right, so, yeah, I, I take that back. You know, just all the basic riffs and like little runs, da 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 all that shit I wrote. Stefan obviously put in like some kind of solo type things, you know, to fill the right. song out that I never did. He does these parts that I, I know I'm preaching to the choir. You, you, you know what I'm about to say. He does these licks that are, Oh, that's like a rock and roll lick. And then like, there's these atonal part to it. That's just like, where did this come from? You know, but it mm -hmm. all works together. So such a creative guitar player. Uh, this next part is instrumental. I'm calling this next part, the bridge. call this next uh, instrumental part the bridge after chorus one like a lyricless bridge yeah musical interlude musical interlude yeah okay that's what that's what, that's what we'll call it it's an eight it's an eight bar musical interlude here the first four bars are halftime bass and guitar are doing a call and response thing it's killer that back and forth thing that, that uh stefan and carl are doing and the last four bars the drums are back to a regular beat and guitar and bass are following each other the final measure the band stops on this e minor chord that rings out it's almost it's e minor with something else and like maybe a sus chord or something stefan's doing there it's really cool the band stops and then we ramp right back up immediately into verse three. Chance of day and spring alive, don't the beat and pie, middle prostitution, in this universal institution. Chance the day and spring a laugh. Don't stray off the beaten path. Mental prostitution in this universal institution. Heavy. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit what does that mean chris i i again i don't have to know what it means to feel it i just i've always loved it i've always loved this song and uh do you recall bill ever saying this to you or Stefan or carl 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 writes great lyrics going what does this mean? Or should we change this line? Or were they happy with everything you had and they, they just took it for face value what it was and it made them feel good like it's making me feel good? I think that's what happened. They just took it. I mean, nobody asked me what it was about, certainly. That's so awesome, though, man. Again, the, the admiration I have for this band, bands, descendants, all, that, that everyone was allowed to be creative. You don't see that in a lot of bands. Yeah, they just let this young fucking punk come in and... Yeah. You got any songs? All right, let's play them. Let's put them on the record. Let's put it first. Uh, yeah, that, that to me is incredible. Yeah, Again, you don't wild. see that a lot. You, you've you seen the band Dynamics out there, and this guy writes, mm -hmm. and this guy writes some too, but the other guy gets pissed when he writes. He gets a little jealous sure. and there's friction, and, and uh, it, that it, it's so refreshing to see it like this and... This is an anomaly. This isn't uh, how it's usually done. I mean, yeah, bands have collaborate, but to have a brand new singer, in, in your case, come in, get the first song off the record is, is, is a great story. Mm -hmm. uh, we get here a third pre-chorus, and you get the first two lines again. This one is a double pre-chorus, though. Uh, 
It's confusion, illusion, and misinterpretation of the original me. You get that again. But then it changes on the back half. Confession, aggression, my time to end the session. One bang and I'm free. There's harmonies on confession and aggression. And the melody on the last line here, it changes again. It's the only time that melody happens in the song. I'm assuming you don't know what the back half of this pre-chorus means, right? Or yes? Yeah, I do. It's, you know, I mean, it's contemplating suicide, basically. You know, it's like, wow. it's like, where is, where, where the fuck am I? What am I doing? Do I want to take it this far? <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, I mean, were, were, were you depressed at this point? Were you? I was not. No, no. Okay. No. Okay. So you're like a lot of us 19 year olds, you're questioning life. You're, Mm -hmm. you know, I think everyone at some point thought of not thought of suicide, like I'm going to do it to myself, but you, you've thought about it. You heard about like, how could someone do that? You're questioning, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of questioning going on here in this. Oh, it is, man. I was a fucking kid. Yeah. Hats off to you for being able to write something like this at that age. You don't see uh, a lot of 19 year olds that can come forward with something like this. After pre-chorus three, we have a double chorus now. What big thoughts you have I can see them in your eyes When you pretend to laugh The reflection I see Reminds me Of somebody like me What big thoughts you have I can see them in your eyes When you pretend to laugh There's harmonies, again, on everything here. Uh, on the third line, when you pretend to laugh, that guitar is panned off left again with that run Stefan's doing. Of somebody like me, that guitar is off the left again doing the, the high-pitched squeal. But the second half here, again, the lyrics are the same. The stereo guitars are still strumming, but Stefan goes off here on the second half. Yeah. The classic classic rock and roll riffs, but with some of those uh, atonal notes uh, thrown in there as well. He's, he's going off there. Do you remember that being tracked in the studio? Were you there for that? Yes, I was there. Yeah, and he kind of does his, uh, like, Chuck Berry having a stroke. (laughs) (laughs) That is the perfect, perfect (laughs) way to describe his playing here. Although, if Chuck Berry had a stroke, it probably wouldn't sound that good. Oh, man. Yeah, Chuck Berry having a stroke. Whenever I hear Stefan play those things in Descendants or All Songs, I'm going to forever think of that. Uh, I might have ruined it. I ruined the band for you. No, no. That is is the perfect uh, descriptor right there. Well, (laughs) after we get... After we get the double chorus here, there's an eight bar outro that is basically the bridge again. This time, the whole band ends instead of that E minor chord that Stefan does uh, earlier in the song in the bridge. It's now major at the end. Was it major when you initially wrote it? I doubt it. I probably didn't put that much thought into it. It was an ending. I still don't think about endings. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> what's interesting about this is how many descendants in all songs end on that minor chord, on that weird, you know, suspense chord type thing. Right. And here it just, it goes, it goes happy at the end. And I, I never thought about it until I cracked this open a couple of days ago and I'm combing through it. And I get to the end, I go, Whoa, it ends major. That's kind of weird for all. I never thought about that either. I I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm going to have to listen to it. (laughs) Yeah, the very last chord just goes to this major E chord. It's not minor and it's not weird, which is which is all signature minor and weirdness. I probably don't even remember it because, I mean, every time we play it live, you know, like when we play live, it seems like everything just ends on an E minor. (laughs) <laughs> everything every fucking song yes. just ends on an email <laughs> very true well okay again we're going back 30 years here and i know that the, you're running on adrenaline you're you're probably still in disbelief you're recording with your heroes you're in a real studio putting this record together do you remember hearing the song back for the first time hearing a mix 
of, of, of what, we, what we hear today. And what were your thoughts? Were you proud? Were you stoked? Were you like, wow, I can't believe how good this came out because it sounds awesome. I mean, I don't actually remember it, no, but I was certainly stoked. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, handing somebody like a piece of shit and they give you back like a fucking diamond ring. <laughs> Maybe not that <laughs> drastic. <laughs> that and your Chuck Berry quote, I think that's what we're going to run in the ads to promote this show, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like I just have some half ass thing and then somebody hands me like this finished like very professional <laughs> song. and of course i'm like holy shit you had every right to be and uh, i i think what i'm going to take away besides the uh, chuck berry having a stroke and uh, the diamond into a piece of uh dung <laughs> what i'm going to take away from this episode <laughs> oh, do i need is, to clean uh, up my language no not at all come on <laughs> but what i really take away from this is the fact that you're still proud of this recording that that's awesome to me because you should be because it sounds great and Absolutely. not a lot of people can look back uh, on something they did thirty years ago. You know, I always equate it to that you know picture you drew for your for your mom on Mother's Day when you were six years old and she still has it hung up in the house. And you're like, come on, mm -hmm. mom. You know, it's uh, you're a little embarrassed, but the fact that you you're so proud of this and like I said, you you should be is is really cool. Appreciate um, it. Before before we break, is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners with of what's going on with you? Any tour dates coming up? What's going on with the Vulture Wake? For starters, uh, yeah, like the song original me. I mean, it's still like, you know, I mean, all fans like different eras, uh, different singers, blah, 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 uh, whatever. But I mean, Original Me is pretty much the song I am known for. You know what I mean? Like songs that I have written. That's like mm -hmm. that's like the song. You know, even though I like I have other songs. I'm really glad that you said that just now because I, I meant to bring this up. Thank, thank you for saying that. I mean, that. thank you, because there are other songs. The, the reason I picked this one was because I remember hearing a story somewhere along the way that you had this in another band, which I was right. This was your first record and you got the first song of the record. Cause I'll tell you, the other song was Silence, which is a beautiful, beautiful song. I can't forget your pictures that I put away. I look at them again someday. I still hold your memory close to me. I've tried to share my thoughts. I love that. And Mass Nerder is my favorite all record that, that the band has ever made. It, it will always be. I just, there's, that was that time period we were out, out touring together. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was what we listened to in the van on the way to the gig. And then we heard the songs every night. And it was just so cool. Silence is great. But I felt there was a great story here with Original Me. And, and uh, there was. Was there? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay. We'll let the listeners be the judge. But, right, uh, yeah. Right. Before, before we break or anything, anything else you'd like to say? Everybody needs to check out my new band, the Vulture Wake. I think it's the best shit I've ever written. Got a band put together. That's pretty, that's pretty hot shit. And, uh, we have a new EP coming out in, uh, June. If it, anyone that's interested, the .com, you can find us. We've got some touring, a little bit of touring coming up and stuff. We're still a new band, you know, so we're like, we're just, we're trying to do as much as we can. And, and, uh, but since nobody knows who we are, it's still tough, but yeah, that's, that's about it. That's awesome. Yeah. Definitely check out a vulture wake. Uh, the new singles called red. It is awesome. And Chad, thank you so much for uh, sitting in with us. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Chris. Good to see you, my man. We did a smile and kiss goodbye. We did a smile and kiss goodbye. Hey, everybody, don't go anywhere. We got the band you might not know. We got the rap segment where Chris and I talk about this episode. We got all that coming up after a few words from our sponsors. Ready for a head-bangingly good time? Dive into the world of heavy metal with the Brutally Delicious podcast. Here, we don't just talk music. We welcome you into our heavy metal family. Join us for candid chats with legends and rising stars. We go beyond the typical interviews, exploring raw emotions and the life-altering impact of heavy metal. So whether you're a diehard metalhead or just curious, join our family and let the headbanging begin with the Brutally Delicious Podcast. <laughs> 
Do you enjoy the content and production of Krista Makes a Podcast? Do you have an idea for a podcast or an existing podcast that you'd like to take to the next level? Well, check out WeKnowPodcasting.com. At WeKnowPodcasting.com, we have over 25 years of combined experience in the pod field, and we're ready to help you succeed in the golden era of podcasting. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is email your best song via MP3 only and bio to bandyoumightnotknow at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is Life Lessons from Oslo, Norway. Their bio says that they bring a different kind of vibe to the easy core genre. Maybe so. All I know is that this rocks. You can find their music on Spotify. And here's a snippet of their song, Nothing Gold Can Stay. Yeah. Never go, never go. The Rap with Chris and Chris. Chris, I never would have imagined as a kid who had all pummel and heard this guy with the gravelly scream. <laughs> I would have thought he would have been this intimidating guy. I never would have thought he would have <laughs> laughed so much. <laughs> yeah, you know, that he's always been chatty. He's never changed in that respect. And uh, his, his laugh's kind of a nervous laugh, I think, when, he, when he's kind of at a loss for words. He doesn't know what to say. You know, he was very shy and very quiet back in the day. I kind of alluded to that at some point in the episode. But, uh, you know, he, he's, he's opened up uh, as, as the years have went by a little bit more. But, yeah, he's just a very quiet person. He was one of those guys that uh, wasn't the alpha dog in the room on tour screaming and going crazy. He was just kind of, you know, you wouldn't even know he was around if you didn't, didn't look, you know. Is there a much cooler story than the story of someone who is a fan of the band who gets to be in his favorite band? Yeah, it, it, especially how young he was. You know, he joined the band when he was like 20, 21 years old. And the other guys had a good, you know, almost a decade on him. And I, I, I said I said during uh, when we were talking that the first time I saw them, the rest of the guys come out. I'm like, who's this kid? Because I hadn't even seen a picture of him yet. And he just killed it that night in Gainesville. Especially not just his own songs, but the back catalog. He did all those all songs justice. They would even throw in a, a Descendants song or two. And he would smash those as well. He was... Uh, such a such a good singer, and you want to talk about uh, the talent as a singer and being so young. Yeah, he he credits to all uh, practicing so much back in those days and, and having someone like Bill on crack on the whip. But there's a there's a natural talent uh, beyond most singers, beyond what I had at 19 years old for sure that he brought into this band. Oh, he's my favorite all singer. I mean, he's one of my favorite punk rock singers ever. Yeah, he's got such a grit. I, I called it gravelly grit to his voice, but it, but it's also pretty, but he also has a scream, which I think rivals any hardcore or metal singer I've ever heard. Yeah, no. And, and in terms of loudness, he's one of the loudest singers I've ever heard. He just gets up there and he just belts. And yeah, you know, I think uh, a lot of us punk rock singers had to sing loud. I've mentioned this before that I haven't heard anybody sing as loud as Roger probably ever, uh, you know, because you start out in punk rock bands, uh, you're playing the you're playing the outhouse in Lawrence, Kansas, as Chad said. And they, the PA is a transistor radio that you're trying to hear your voice over the band. You got to be loud. And Chad always projected and and uh, getting to see that band every night just Besides the rhythm section of, of Carl and Bill and, and of course, Stefan, but just getting to watch Chad with them. He was a, a complete pro and uh, the band was just was just on fire every night. Yeah, I tried, as I always do as the producer of this show, I didn't fanboy out too much. But what I could have said to him, I don't know if he has a lot of people saying this to him or if this is rare that someone says this to him. But I, as a young person, discovered all because I saw them on MTV on 120 Minutes, which I was probably watching to see like the new Nine Inch Nails video or something. <laughs> and I just saw this band, didn't know anything about their background, just liked the song Million Bucks, bought the album, and that was my introduction to them. They were one of the first punk rock bands I ever liked or, or heard. So it was really crazy for me to hear, because I never looked into this before, that he was so young. 
I didn't think of him as being super young. Yeah, he was he was a kid. You know, like I said, I, I saw them on that on that first tour. Couldn't believe how how young he was, and I had known nothing about him. Two, two weeks prior to seeing them, I had heard breaking things come over the PA. As I said, I didn't know who it was. Like, oh, this is the new all. Like, what? I didn't even, didn't know they had a new record out, let alone a new singer. Information was a little slower back then. You know, if you if if you didn't catch the article in the in the zine at your punk rock record store or something, or if there wasn't a poster in the record store. Or skate shop of a band's new record you, a lot of times you didn't know about it yeah you sure didn't sound like a kid i think they performed on 120 minutes or did it some sort of live performance if i remember correctly i think i might have it on a vhs taped somewhere not that that would work now but uh you know i i think that yeah they're such an awesome band i would have never known he was that young i think that point about the fact that they practiced so much approached it like a full-time job that's why they're so good. Yeah, right? they they were they were going for what the band's name was. They were going for all, and the premise of going for all is that no matter what you do, if uh, you're going to be a doctor, be the best doctor you can be. If you're going to be a musician, and and that's that's what they set out to do. I just think it's it's so cool that I like I said I know no Chad can get around a guitar, but the fact that he was right in the major uh, portions of the ru- the guitar runs and the parts of this song. Yeah, Stefan and the band added their nuances, but uh, uh, 19 years old, he, he came up with this song and he's, you know, uh, a little bit dismissive of the song uh, just, you know, because yeah. uh, it is so old, but at the same time, he uh, did say he's proud of his vocal performance on it, which I, I thought that's really cool because it's it does sound great. I imagine it is hard to talk about such an old song it might be like someone coming up to you and being like chris tell us the entire story of liquor store and you could be like well i went to the liquor store and i bought some liquor i don't maybe there is a good story to that i'm just using that as an example no that's that that's actually a great example because i wouldn't i wouldn't have much to talk about that song to be honest with you i, I barely remember writing that one but it, it, it is a fan favorite and you can you can never replace the feelings of the fans you know the fans are the ones that make bands into who they are make them uh, I don't know, stars, so to speak. And looking back, it's like, here I am talking to my friend Chad, but I'm still as big of a fan as I was back in the day. You know, I'm still, you know, there's just still a little bit of fanboy coming out here and I'm just trying to collect myself. This song and his band mean so much to me. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, he said it. It's like, this song's like 30. Do you remember where you were 30 years ago? <laughs> well, you know, another thing, Chris, and you talked about this, we've talked about this on a lot of episodes, is, yeah, maybe Chad as a young person thought to himself as he's writing, oh, I'm just going to write some stuff that sounds like cool stuff to sing. Maybe it sings well, or maybe he's just like, oh, these are cool words to say, without thinking a lot about what they mean to him. But you take away your own interpretations in music, and things that he's singing that might not mean much to him on like a deep level might mean something to someone else who's hearing it because you attribute your own meaning to it and it might be the most meaningful thing in the world to someone else. And I'm sure that's not the case just when we're talking about original me. I'm sure that's the case all the time, every day with music. They're all the time people are writing things that just sound cool or you know, make you feel a certain way, but don't necessarily have some deep meaning attached to it. But the listener attaches their own meaning to it. Absolutely. You know, you go to a whatever, an Elton John concert, and you see 30 people in the front row crying, men and women, and they're all crying for a different reason. You know, that song has touched them in some way and reminded them of something in their life. You know, pre-chorus three here, the double pre-chorus, the uh, last... uh, Last half of it. Confession, aggression. My time to end the session. One bang and I'm free. He did say that was like about, yeah, about ending it, about suicide. I was like, wow. And, and I, I said, hey, don't mean to get too personal. Were you thinking, were you suicidal? He's like, no. I just was thinking about things that you think about when you're 19. You know, you're not necessarily questioning your, your mortality, but you're questioning life. Right. Yeah. Just because you're not thinking about committing suicide yourself doesn't mean you're not thinking about the concept of it or someone that you might know that might be struggling with that or just, yeah, just the concept in general. And once again, if that's a line that someone took something away from, if someone was having suicidal thoughts, for example, saw that lyric or heard that song and took away that, yo, I'm not alone in feeling like this, you know, this guy singing in my favorite band he's felt this way that's a perfect example of taking away your own meaning from a song where maybe the person writing it was just writing words 
Yeah, good good point. I'll tell you what else is a good point, Chris. What's that? People out there, if you are not part of our supporting cast, our VIP program, head over to ChrisDemakes.com. You get extra bonus episodes of the After Party. You can be a contestant on our very own game show, Defeat Demakes, all kinds of other perks. Head over to ChrisDemakes.com. We'd love for you to join us and be a part of our supporting cast. That was a breakneck segue, man. That was, <laughs> that was, that was impressive. You went, <laughs> We went from heavy subject matter to our sporty cast, and I think that's great. Um, also, Chris, if anyone out there is listening and you enjoy this podcast, hit that fifth star wherever you listen. If you listen on Apple, if you listen on Spotify, there's a little star system. Hit that fifth star uh, because that lets the world know that you like our show and the more of those little five star ratings we hit the more people are going to find out about our podcast chris what's funny about that is i actually don't know if that's true (laughs) i just assume that that's true why else would you have that we'd appreciate the fifth star is my point that's right It, it if if nothing else it makes us look good we try our best we try our best to deliver a great show thank you so much if you haven't already joined the chris makes a podcast facebook group we'd love to have you follow me on instagram at less than chris d and i want to thank this week's guest Chad Price for joining us. We'll see you next week. Ready for a head-bangingly good time? Dive into the world of heavy metal with the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Here, we don't just talk music. We welcome you into our heavy metal family. Join us for candid chats with legends and rising stars. We go beyond the typical interviews, exploring raw emotions and the life-altering impact of heavy metal. So whether you're a diehard metalhead or just curious, join our family and let the headbanging begin with the Brutally Delicious Podcast. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA Podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living, and every week I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping you do the same. So if that sounds cool, you can listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com, and I'll see you there.